Okay. We begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your love again. And Lord, we are just stand amazed in the presence of Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, for all that he's done for us. Lord, help us now as we consider all the assets he's given us. Uh, Lord, help us to be greatly encouraged. Help us to greatly desire them to be more committed to you than we've ever been in our life. And I pray, Lord, there be one here that's name is not written down in glory. They're not sure that their name's written in the book of life. Lord, I pray today they would turn from their sin and turn to the grace and, and receive it uh, freely that flows from the, the cross of Jesus Christ and, and believe and trust in you. Lord, I just pray that you would be glorified now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as Americans got some issues, okay? <laughs> we hate to lose, don't we? Who here likes to lose? I didn't think there'd be any. We challenge one another just about anything, right? And everything imaginable. I can eat more X than you. And I can do it faster than you can too. We, so we have hot dog contests, which to me is a glutton contest. Check out those weekend players and spectators involved in a football game across our land in the fall. I don't know who's more competitive, <laughs> the fans <laughs> or the players, right? I see some fans dressed up like they're ready to kill somebody. On the other team, and they got, they're more intense than the players themselves. One would think it's a religion. They will do anything and everything to win. As the old adage goes, winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. We are very competitive as a society, and losing is just not an option for us. So what do you seek to win, though? What are you seeking to win in life? A contest? A better job? The lottery? Some of your eyes perked up on that one. I hope you're not trying to win that. Don't even try. Success in sports, arts. Be better than your parents. Be better than the guys across the cubicle or across the fence. What drives you? What drives you? This passage that uh, Tim just read and which we'll consider this morning really gets to the question, what drives you in life? What do you want to win? What makes you pursue and gives you hope and life. Two weeks ago before Mother's Day, we began a discussion about this spiritual accounting from Philippians 3. Paul was looking at his assets, his long resume of accomplishments, and when he was done summing everything up, what did he come out with? When he counted everything, what was his final analysis? It was all what? Just garbage. All his religious advantages, all his heritage, when he faced Christ on the road to Damascus, it all became rubbish. A pile of manure for you <laughs> cattle herdsmen out there. All the things of self-righteousness and worldly accolades apart from Christ, you know, they're all just dung. All the so-called gains, they're just what? They're liabilities. Now, this is really against our thinking, isn't it? This is, this is against our, our nature. He counted all the trophies, so-called trophies, and he just looked at them and all the sheepskins, and he just threw them all in the trash. All the achievements, all the assets, all the so-called worldly strengths were all what? Lost. 
everything apart from what God has given us by grace through Jesus Christ is to be viewed as loss. But the good news is everything that we have in him, which is way more, is to be considered true assets. We started to look at some of those true assets if you're following your notes. If anyone needs any notes, uh, we can just raise your hand and one of the men in the back will get you. If you, if you want notes, just kind of look back at Denny. Denny, if they need the notes. I don't know if there's any more back there. If you want the notes, just have them. Uh, they're good to follow along on. Uh, we started to look at some of the assets, and we'll continue with those today. You know, true assets to be sought in life. The first one, as you remember, was to win Christ. I just want to review that. Uh, to win Christ, uh, the word there is hooper echo, means the compound word means to hold over one. Uh, and the idea there is we are to know the excellence of, let me get to the right passage, Philippians uh, Philippians 3. That, that word there uh, in verse 8 the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. We're going to get onto that more today. But this excellence has the idea of, of, you know, when he thought about Jesus Christ and the more he got to know him, the more he got to walk with him, the greater and greater and the more superior the knowing of, of the, uh, the knowing and the fellowship of Christ became in his life. And that's the idea there. Uh, the more you see Jesus Christ, the more you know him, the more the the more you fellowship with him, the more impressed you will be with him day by day. He is quite impressive, isn't he? And then the answer to prayer and his grace and his forgiveness in your life. I would go so far to say that anything that charms me in life, and including catching fish, they don't come even close. They don't even hold a candle to knowing him, to walking with him. Nothing in this world apart from him is worth anything. And they should be viewed as pure manure. But the second one is to seek union with God. Look at verse 9. And be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of, Je of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Be found in him. This has the idea of union with him, to be in Christ, to be covered with his righteousness. If I can bring it down to our English terms, I don't want religion. All right? What does religion get you? <laughs> I don't want religion. And, and I really don't want my self-righteousness. I, I have found my self-righteousness, whether in Christ or outside of Christ, really is not worth a whole lot, is it? My view before I came to Christ is that if I do good, if I'm better than the guy next to me, then... You know, and the good outweighs the bad, then I'll go to heaven. But apart from Christ, what is our righteousness? Not worth a whole lot, is it? I have found religion and self-righteousness, as did Paul. He knew it better than I did. <laughs> he, I mean, he played the game like none of, no one could ever play the game of righteousness and religion. And he found them to be quite lacking. I want to be clothed in his righteousness. Especially when I stand before him. Can you imagine being clothed in your own righteousness when you face God? They're going to be found those that are in that situation are going to find that their religion, their own righteousness, all their acts that they tried to do to earn their way to heaven or to earn favor with the, in the sight of God, they're going to see those, that, that righteousness and it's, they're going to feel naked and greatly ashamed. 
I want to be clothed with his righteousness. I want to be clothed with him alone and, and not my own. This union is brought about by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's not about me, right? And it's not about you. What did we ever do? When have we ever been so faithful to earn anything in the right standing with God? It is his faithfulness, his faithfulness to go to the cross. It is his faithfulness in his life and his obedience. It is his faithfulness. Of the one who loved me and died in my place, and it is realized by personal faith response to that finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. You know, the Jewish way and the way for many Americans is what must a man do. I must do this. I must go to church. I must dress right. I must act right. I must love my parents. I must honor my parents. All good things, right? In one sense. But if I do them to be declared right in God's sight, then I'm in trouble. If I do it on the other side of the cross, so to speak. If I do them to be declared right and expect judgment to be favorably, I'm all wrong. The answer is obey a set of laws. Obey a set of rules. Whether they're Moses' rules, they're the Pope's rules, or they're Mohammed's rules, if I obey those rules, I'll be right in God's sight. I'll be declared right. The answer is what? No, you will not. Because righteousness is imputed by God, <laughs> not imparted by us or by anybody else. It is imputed by God through faith, not imparted by achievements. You and I must appropriate for ourselves by trusting in him, putting our personal faith in him, our total reliance upon him. And again, the question is, have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? If you have never put your personal faith in him, for by faith are you saved, by, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, like any man should boast, it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. If you've never done that, then you are clothed in your own righteousness, and not Christ, because you are not in union with him. If you have not, then today, realize that you're not good enough, nor could you ever be good enough, nor could any human being be good enough to ever stand before God and say, I'm good enough. Especially when you have to stand before the one who has the nails prints in his hand and in his side, the one who died for you, and said, you know what? You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. But in me, you will be accepted. Because I will clothe you with my righteousness and not your own. You know, your righteous acts, apart from God, like Paul's, are nothing but filthy rags, it says in the scriptures. All the children gone? Oh, not all of them. <laughs> nothing but menstrual clothing to be trashed. Filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind 
have taken us away. Union with God. But also seek true and abiding fellowship with Christ. And there is verse 10. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. Fellowship of his suffering. And being made conformable unto his death. Fellowship with God is always based upon his righteousness. And this fellowship has four sides to it. Number one, intimate knowledge. When we get more acquainted with our great God and our Savior and develop a growing understanding of his character and his commandments, a growing understanding of his will, when we learn and then practice his ways and his example, then and only then a life transform, a life transforming fellowship will be accomplished with you and with your heavenly friend. That's fellowship. That's fellowship with Jesus Christ. That I may know him. It's interesting this is not the word of knowledge that has the idea of knowing like you know your spouse. Or there's this growing understanding. And you get to the point where you, you, know, you start thinking, well, I know what you're going to say. You do that and you get in trouble when you do that, man. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to do. I can anticipate it. It's not that kind of abiding knowledge. Here it's actually knowledge, knowing him. And the knowledge, though, is more than just facts, right? Well, so that you can answer questions back in junior church, right? It's not that kind of knowledge. It is this growing understanding of his character. It's, it's reading the Gospels and saying this is how he lives. I, I mean, I spent the last two years, I, and maybe we will spend two more years of on, on Wednesday night, some prayer meeting, just doing, going through the gospel step by step, his life, to know his character, what made him tick. Why did he do the things he did? Why did he say the things he, he said? How did he relate to his disciples? How did he relate to the Pharisees? Why did he do these things in those three and a half years? Three, three and a half years. Why? Why did God put him in four books? And then write 23 more in the New Testament about those four books. Why did he do that? So that you would know him. Know Christ. Know him. So I ask you a question. How well do you know your Bible? How well do you know your Bible? Again, this is not to win some quiz at the national or the local center county Bible drill contest. No, it's, that's not what it is. How well do you know the Bible? How well do you know the God of the Bible? These three verses, 9, 10, and 11, speak about theology. We'll get to that at the end. But if you don't know your God, how do you ever expect to live right and walk right? Well, I'll just come to church on Sunday morning. Well, good, <laughs> but really, that's just a start, isn't it? In that personal walk with God to know him. It's a good start, but it needs to go on that. It's only a starting point in knowing God, but walking with him in fellowship as he speaks to you through his word. And as you learn to grow in the understanding of what pleases him will increase your growth, your usability, and your dependence upon Jesus Christ. It's just like your marriage for us of that are married here today. I've been married now 25 <laughs> years and just about nine some odd months here, nine months plus, a few days, I've been married to one. It is a lifetime of getting to know her and a lifetime of her getting to know me. Now, it's, the illustration kind of breaks down because there's some good, <laughs> good points and bad points about us. But when you get to know Jesus Christ, it's all good, right? It's all good. Even the suffering and the death that we're going to soon look at, even the suffering and the death is part of it, the more you get to know him. 
It has been said, well, it's been said well, to know him is to love him. And the more you get to know him, the more you'll love him. And the more you'll appreciate what he's done for you. The more gratitude you'll have, the more joy you'll have in your soul. To love him is to know him. And to know him is to love him. Number two, resurrection power. The word power here is dynamos. It is uh, the idea of inherent power. It is the power residing in the thing by virtue of its nature. Okay, a bulldozer has extreme power <laughs> based upon the horsepower and the engine that drives it. And our power is the resurrection. There is great power in the resurrection. It is the most powerful with God, the resurrection. Without it, you would have no hope. Without it, you would have no hope of an eternity with God. Without it, you would have no hope for today. It is that important, the resurrection. At conversion, we are taken from spiritual death to spiritual life through the Spirit. Romans 8, 11 says this, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or put to light, bring to life your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Spiritual life, spiritual death to spiritual life through the spirit and through obedience to his word, we get victory over sin in our walk with Christ. The power of the resurrection is the very cornerstone of New Testament, New Testament theology. Everything hangs off of the resurrection. Think today where you would be without the resurrection. And don't say I would be home on Easter Sunday, <laughs> okay? Where would you be without the resurrection in your life? Where would you be? I know where I would be. I wouldn't be here today. I probably would be in a grave by now with the way I live. Where would you be without the resurrection? Think about it. And when you think about the resurrection in your life, and this is something to think about as you go through today, think about the resurrection and the power it's given into your life transforming you from death, spiritual death to spiritual life. Then tap into it. Tap into that resurrection power, into that grace and that power each and every day, day by day. And when you do that, it will provide you life and confidence for today and for the future. These first two don't sound so bad, right? To know him. To live in the power of that resurrection. That's great, Pastor. Why don't you just end it there? Because I don't want to go to this suffering and death stuff. But we need to. The next two are a different story, are they not? Sharing in his sufferings. The sufferings of Christ. If I had a hand survey now... Anyone want to suffer today? I don't think too many would ever raise their hand. Sufferings with Christ. Fellowship with him involves suffering for a Christian at one level or another. Now, obviously, in this country right now, eight more years, maybe, <laughs> it will happen if it doesn't happen in the last couple months here. Uh, Suffering, suffering with him. Never ever consider that fellowship, right? But that's fellowship. When we imitate him in obedience, we will be like him in experience, which is sufferings and rejection by those around us. This world does not love or want him, 
So the more you draw near to him, you will experience the same loneliness and the same hurt he did. Chris touched on this in Sunday school this morning. You will experience the same rejection. And with rejection comes loneliness and hurt, even by those that you thought loved you. But those are the ones he came to die for. He came to die for those, in fact, even the ones that flatly rejected him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I can't imagine his sufferings. But you know, every time you share the gospel with somebody and they reject you, every time you love somebody, you pray for somebody and they spit in your face or ignore you, every time you do a good deed to somebody and they reject it, you are bearing in his sufferings. His sufferings for this world. And you are having fellowship with him. You know, this is a sour pill, but it is necessary for our growth in Christ and our fellowship with him. Remember, no matter how deep the hurt of those that reject the gospel and reject you, it doesn't come close. It doesn't even hold a candle to the rejection that he feels, the hurt that he felt as they mocked him upon him. And refused to obey the Father's will. He endured the cross. And you know what? He still endures it in glory this day. It is through suffering we bear fruit for him. Therefore, the suffering with him and in him is worth it all. So bear along with it, be patient with it in this idea of suffering. Being made conformable unto his death, the fourth one. The Greek word here is sum morpho. It has the idea of to be morphed into, sum morpho. It means to assimilate into or to be made over into his death. Anyone ever watched the Extreme Makeover show? You like that show? It's a great show, right? It's a positive show. <laughs> Extreme Makeover. It's a popular TV show that transforms a house of those who are less fortunate in a given community. We actually have one in my community near, very near our house that had this. I think he was uh, came back from the war uh, in Iraq, and uh, they 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 redid his whole house. And um, it's more than a home improvement, right? If you ever watched a show. I mean, I watched the, the flips and the flops and all the other shows that my wife had to endure on HGTV. But uh, some were okay. But uh, six hours of it's not good. But, um, you know, those are home improvements. There's still a foundation. There's still some things that stay the same. But extreme makeover is a what? I mean, it is... Uh, complete transformation of the house. It's as if they just blew it up and then put a new one on top. That's really the way it is. It's an extreme makeover. It is a sum morpho, right? It's an extreme makeover. Each episode features a family that has faced some sort of recent or ongoing hardship, such as a natural disaster of a family member, life-threatening illnesses, or it's just in need of a new hope in life. It's a trick. A tremendous makeover that they get. But you know what? We have had a tremendous makeover too, if you're in Christ. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a what? New creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A, a sumorpho has happened to you. We have had a tremendous makeover 
Well, God wants to have fellowship with his, us as his children to do an extreme makeover in us. If we are but willing and pursue him and allow him to do in our fellowship with him what he wants to do. And by this makeover, you will note for us, it involves death. Now you're saying, well, God, this sounds like something from Waco, Texas here. We're all going to die. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about that kind of a death, physical death. It's more of a spiritual death. The other one's kind of morbid. But in fact, it is a true being conformable to his Death, which actually means what? Life. When you are conformed to his death, it really brings you life. I know we're saying a lot of things that don't make a whole lot of sense to our mortal minds, but they are true spiritually for those that experience them by faith. It will bring life. How does one become like Christ in his death? You ever ponder that one? Well, that's what this passage is asking you to ponder. How can I be like Christ in his death? Well, here's the answer, I believe. Well, consider his death. His death was the ultimate example of what? Obedience. You know that stuff back in chapter 2? Remember that verses, humility of Christ? In his obedience unto death, even death of the cross. Let's read verse 2 9 again. Wherefore God, oh, I got the wrong verse. Be found fashion him. Okay, verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. His death was the ultimate example of obedience, humility, and obeying the Father's will. So if you have your notes there, obedience, humility, and obeying the Father's will. That's what his death brought about in his own life. It brought a release from this world, a release from the sin, and the entrance into heaven. That's what his death brought about for him. It brought about a new life, a new relationship with his father. Now, I granted, he always had this for that brief time here on earth. He always had that. It brought about a new life. Whereas, if we put it in our our shoes, we are to live the new life, the resurrected life, fellowship in Christ, and in this it entails dying to self and dying to the world within the context of what Paul's speaking here. Dying to self, dying to the world, And thus living for God in the example of Jesus Christ through humility and obedience to the will of God for our lives. That's really what this being made conformable to his death is. It is. It's a passing from death to life in him. Just as Christ denied himself and was obedient to death, even death of the cross, so we must die to sin and self and live for him. And when we do so, we are becoming like him in his death, passing through death into new life in the presence of God, dying and rising with Christ. This is not the only passage that Paul speaks about this. It is in other places in his uh, New Testament. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 6, verse 10. Romans 6, 10. Romans 6, 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Turn to 2 Corinthians. Go a little forward there. 2 Corinthians 5. Another one of those grand passages here. 2 Corinthians 5. 14 through 15. 
For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. See that? He lived for him. Die to the world, live to him. Die to self, die to sin, live for him. With respect to these last two, suffering and death, the Apostle Peter also speaks of our fellowship with him through the seemingly painful trials with joy for his glory, that we must boast in his power and not our own. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter 4, 12 through 14. There's this suffering, death, and fellowship idea again here. Peter talks about it. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice, have joy, in so much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of God, glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. When you and I allow God's grace, the grace of God, to free us from our self-efforts, to gain approval or acceptance, and, our, and we devote ourselves to following these four aspects of fellowship with Christ, then we will experience newness of life and true joy and true assets. All right, my man Asher, here we go. We're going to go to our chart again. Joy. And here we are in chapter 3, and I did have my notes. I lost my notes. Here they are. All right, Asher. He talks about in three one, join the Lord. Now, I believe this whole chapter talks about it. Join the Lord, and that we should have joy in him, the person of him. But what steals that joy in the Lord? Well, glorifying in human achievements, right? When we glory in our human achievements, whether they are our own, your own self-righteousness or your self-pursuits, none of those will bring us joy, will they? They may bring some trophies and bring uh, others to, to tell us that they're, you know, we're great, but you know what? They mean nothing. Attempting to gain favor or acceptance apart from Christ, Jesus is but rubbish. Who is our joy? Christ is our joy. He is your joy, my joy. His righteousness, his work on our behalf, his person, his sufferings, his resurrection, and his life. That is our joy. Next one. But I also see we see joy and sanctification here in verse 10. I mean, now this joy in the Lord, I think he gives... These are like A, B, and C that we're going to go through here in the rest of the chapter. We have joy in sanctification. When we are set apart for him, when our lives are set apart from him. Now, this is, this is where Christians, we, this is where we need to do our part. We need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. This is our part to do. He won't, he won't force it on us. We have to be willing to set our side, to be devoted to him. When we do that, we will get joy. Uh, knowing and having fellowship with him and his abiding love, and this will produce joy. But what steals that joy? Well, from this passage, living for life for self and living for the world, uh, that will kill your joy. You may have instant happiness and gratification, right? But in the long end, it's going to kill your joy. Uh, living life for self, living life immersed in the things of this world, that is a true joy stealer. All right, back to verse 11. There's one more here, Philippians 3.11, and then we'll close this out. Ephesians 3.11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, we gain glorification with Christ. This is the final step, the final stage of sanctification, so to speak. At conversion, we are given new life, Spiritually, the body is still dead and dying. I don't know about you. I, I felt it last night, <laughs> yesterday, coming home. All right? That the body is dying. All right? Fast. Quicker than you think. Right? 
In our Christian life, we successively and progressively change in our moral life, but the physical body is dying. And we shall die in one sense physically. Not spiritually, but physically. But ultimately, God wants to change that body, doesn't he? Just like he wants to change us spiritually, he is going to change our physical bodies. We call this resurrection and glory. And I think this is what Paul's speaking about there. He's now looking in the future and saying, ultimately, I am going to be delivered from this life and this body of death, and I will be glorified with Jesus Christ. And that's where he goes here. We will be transformed just like Jesus Christ was transformed. We will be brought to an eternal resting place of resurrection from the dead, and we call this glorification. Paul wanted to know Christ in his personal walk. He wanted to ultimately be like him in his life and in his service, as I long to be like him in his work and his service. I hope you do too. But ultimately, I want to be like him in his resurrection in the glorified state. I don't know about you, but sin in this world gets to you. <laughs> you can only take so much of it. And you long for heaven, and we should all long for heaven. We should all long for him coming back again to take us to himself. And we call this glorified state heaven. Someday, some glorious day, we will enjoy a complete transformation of the character, a newness of body fashioned like to his glorious body, and we will truly live in a perfect environment. Now this is ultimate joy. Saving faith is great. This present life with him in service is grand. But being with him face to face, well, that is glory. Fullness of joy. Complete salvation. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. 26 and 27. For then, let me make sure. Okay, it's actually 20. Well, it's 26 or 28. You need your notes there. For then must he have suffered, often suffered, have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin for the sacrifice of, by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered, once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Unto salvation. First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one and three through nine. First Peter one, three through nine. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations at the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found to, unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love, in whom now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. In these three verses, we see the central doctrines of the Christian faith revealed in the New Testament. Paul describes succinctly and successively New Testament Systematic theology in these three verses, 9, 10, and 11. In verse 9, justification. Justification, just as if I never sinned. Because I'm clothed with his righteousness. Sanctification. In verse 10, a model for Christian growth. This verse is, verse 10, 
Christians are to be like Christ. This growth is a progressive, not obtaining perfection. It is progressive, not perfection, but rather completeness through clinging to his promises, obeying his words, and submitting to his will. We call that sanctification. Don't let anyone fool you out there. <laughs> you are to become holy like he is holy. That is what he desires for your life. And finally, glorification, verse 11. Now that's perfection. We don't get per perfect, so to speak, as in without sin in this life. We become more complete in him from day one to the last day. But the perfection comes in glorification. Ultimate sanctification when we see Christ. I find that Christians often balk at theology. But theology, proper theology, is the antidote for poor living. You live these verses... If you really truly live to these verses, if you cling to them, if you follow them, then you will be well on your way to walking a pleasing life in his sight. And you will have an expectation of future rewards if you do so. This, these three verses are a model on how to live, knowing him, living in the power of the resurrection suffering with him and being made conformable unto his death. So what items on your listing in your asset column of the ledger of life? What items are you listing there? Paul, before his conversion, had these. <laughs> but after... After conversion, he had one item on that list. It's Christ. Christ. That's it. Christ. I want to know him. I want to have fellowship with him. I want to see him in glory someday. I want his resurrection life not just to transform me in the future. I want it to transform me day by day in a new way of living and in life. So what are you listing in your asset columns of the leisure of your life? Where is your joy? Where's your joy? Is it in stuff or is it in a person? Is it about what you can do or are you more and more impressed what Christ has done for you in an abiding in what he is continually providing you by grace? Have you won Christ? Do you joy in union and fellowship with him? Or is your life about making you happy? If it is the latter, no, you'll have happiness for a season. But you'll never obtain joy. And you certainly will not attain glorification with Christ, the ultimate. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, thank you for your love. Lord, thank you that you died for us and you desire us to know you. And you know that knowing you, knowing your character, knowing your ways and your will, that that will transform our lives into something that is beneficial to us and for the world around us. And Lord, we will have great reward in heaven when we see you. The road is not paved with smooth uh, concrete or macadam, Lord. You know that it's a rocky road. It's got a lot of stumbling places to stumble or potholes in it. Mountains to climb over. Some are climbing over mountains, Lord, that just seem like they never end. Lord, I pray you give them the grace to continue to walk with you, to abide in you, to seek fellowship with you. And Lord, to know someday 
the sun will shine again, whether in this life, well, we don't know, but certainly in eternity when we see you face to face and you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So, Lord, help us to know you, help us to love you, help us to fellowship and abide in that fellowship. And, Lord, if there be one here that doesn't know you or doesn't seek to abide in you, Lord, I pray you change their heart today. Help them to come see me or see someone that brought them or they know here and get things right with you before it's too late. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tim's going to come.